OK, uh, welcome everyone. This is the final exam review for EEC E2310. Um, this portion of the course is mostly computer architecture things. So if you are a computer engineering major, you'll have to take a class called computer architecture. If you're double E, you can take that class, but you don't have to, I think. That's what I understand. Um, but th this kind of stuff, it's, it's really complicated when you first look at it, but if you take it step by step, I promise it's not that bad and you will need to know it for computer architecture. So. Also, this exam, the final exam is cumulative, so if there's we can run through these topics and if it's easy, then let me know and we can go back and look at some stuff from the other. Parts of the class like uh, K maps and Boolean algebra and stuff like that. Just just let me know what's easy and what's hard and we can focus on the things that are hard. But first of all. Um, MIPS. So MIPS is kind of like a. It's a type of assembly language that's pretty easy to learn. It's pretty good for learning. Um, you'll probably see something like this where you have like a list of commands. I think there's maybe like 10 that you need to know about. Um, some of them like add, subtract, add immediate, probably. Um, multiply. And divide maybe. And some of them are kind of wacky, so. You guys have talked about these commands and like RS and RT and RD and stuff like that, right? OK, so let's look at. Um, th these are from the slides, so we'll just kind of run through this really quickly. There's basically the three main types, the R type, which usually has two registers and you're doing some sort of operation on them. So for example, like an add. Um, you are storing into the contents of T2 the sum of T1 and T0. So that's what this looks like. T2 equals T0 plus T1 from this add command. And when you're mapping this into bits to get the, the, the instruction as a string, um, you'll notice that RD is the la is the so in this case, RD is T2. That one goes here, so T2 would go there. And RS and RT are these ones. So it kind of gets flipped. If you were to look at um, the add command, it goes T2, T0, T1. But then the order of the, the bits goes opcode, RS, RT, RD, and then all that. So the last one, T1 is your RS. Wait, sorry. T0 is your RS. T1 is your RT. And T2 is your RD. And you can kind of think of them as like, like source, target, and destination. I don't know if you talked about those, but sometimes they get switched around. So I just like to try and remember which ones go where. Um, because it can get a little wacky when you sometimes you don't have all three registers in there. But okay, that's the R type instruction. Um, this mapping is consistent for all the R type instructions. So if you can remember that when you have these three registers, this is how they get put into the bits, then then you'll be good for these ones. The opcodes, you'll probably be given a, a chart for opcodes, and those are six bits. And you also have a function code. And I'm pretty sure the function sh code should also be given to you in some kind of table. Um, do you know, did your professor say you don't have to remember these, do you? Yeah, good, good. Okay. Sure. Very good. And then the other parts, so like if we want to map RS into bits, RS here is zero, so that is five zeros. T1, we'll just do a binary one, which is zero, 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 one. And then T2 is a binary two, that's zero, 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 one, zero. Should be pretty good at that type of binary by this point. And the shift amount, yeah, shift amount is zero for all the instructions we're using. These are from um, Dr. Kogan's slides. So we'll we'll come back to this one. Uh, the I type. So any instruction that has an immediate, so a number that you type in, they're going to work a little bit differently because you need a lot of space to store that number. 
Um, in this case, we have 16 bits of immediate. Sixteen bits of immediate. So since we only have two registers, right? These instructions are a total of thirty-two bits. If you ever forget the, if you ever forget how these things are laid out, just remember that the registers are each five bits in this instruction set. So five bits. Your opcode is six bits. Six plus five plus five is sixteen. You have thirty-two bits total. So that means the immediate has 16 bits. So you can always kind of reconstruct uh, how many bits each thing has if you know some of them. So the I type instructions, these ones, uh, things like the add immediate and the load word, um, where you need to have uh, a number that you type in. So add immediate, I think, is probably the easiest to understand because it's like instead of a register here, you're just putting a number. So this an add immediate T2, T0, and 25 would say T2 equals T0 plus 25, and that's a, it's a base 10, 25. Um, and this is how it gets broken up. If you, uh, you, you can map the registers the same way. So, um, if our if if this is our instruction add i uh, t2 t0 and 25 then your rs is t0 and your rt is t2 um i don't i don't know if there's like a i don't know if i got all the slides from dr kogan i emailed her and asked for the slides um so i don't know if there's a slide that explained that a little bit better but it's the same way as in the Three register command. Your RS is your first argument. Your RT is your second argument, and RD is where the result gets stored. So it's kind of the same way here, except for there's no RD. So we have to uh, we we have to adjust it a little bit. But your immediate, in this case, is 25. So 25 gets converted into binary, and that's um, 25 in binary is 16 plus 8 plus 1, which is 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Add immediate is probably the easiest one. Load word, uh, that type has a register, a, re a register, and an offset. So, And if you ever do assembly outside of this class, it might look a little bit different. This is just one um, instruction set. They're not all the same. They're not all like this, but MIPS is MIPS is a pretty pretty simple, simplified and standard one. But if you ever get like in computer architecture class, you might dig into different ones where things are a little bit different, um, but the concepts are mainly the same. So, and then also in this class, you, you use Zybooks, right? In Zybooks, it's like an even simplified form. So if if I if I mess anything up, let me know because I don't have uh, access to the Zybooks anymore. But I do have access to like MIPS uh, MIPS in general. Like uh, th these things, you can find them online, like the MIPS instruction set, and you can find things like the the op codes just on on these pages. So that's like public information. But Zybooks is like proprietary, and it's a simplified form that you use for this class. So let me know if I'm if I'm kind of like overreaching or missing some of the things that you've talked about in class because I don't want to mislead you for the exam. But um, in general, this is this is how you do it. OK, so for a for a load word and a store word, you have the offset. You have this register, which is is going to hold an address, and this is the register that you're loading into. So if S1. If the contents of S1 were the address hex um 2048 maybe then your offset is zero so this load word command is going to store is going to set the contents the contents of s0 equal the contents or or 
a memory access of the address hex 2048, which is the contents of S1, plus your offset, which is zero in this case. And a lot of times you will see that the offset is zero, um, but, but there is an add operation that's happening here. So you're loading the contents of this register, or you're loading the uh, address specified by this bit into this register, S0. And this is an important command, and this is a memory access, and internally there's an add happening. It does require an add operation here. So we'll just do an overview of this, and then once we get into the, the diagram, then we'll kind of unpack everything. It might make a little more sense, but I'm, I'm sure you guys have talked about these things at least a little bit before. Um, is there a certain type of instruction that you think is especially difficult? Yeah, OK, so. Like the back, like the previous one for like add would be like the address you're storing it and your the register you're storing it to first and that the RSRC, this one's like. Okay, the this one's the opposite. So. Let's look at, uh, I think this one has, yeah, okay, so this this is a, a page that has a, kind of like a breakdown of all the commands. So if we look at an add instruction, add rd rs rt. So um, it, it kind of, it kind of works like a, like the equal sign, like add t0, t1, t2 means T0 equals T1 plus T2, right? That one's kind of nice because it's like in order. Where the first one is, is what's on the equal sign. Um, the we were just looking at a. Uh, we were just looking at. And a load word you wanted to see. Yeah, so. So if we look over here on load word, that's going to be on like memory access. So here, load word, RT offset RS. So your RT is the, the contents of the memory address. So RS is going to have a memory address. You're going to grab the contents of that memory location and store it into RT. So um, it, it does get switched. So if you look at the command here, it goes RS and RT. Okay, let's just copy that. Uh, right here. Yeah, I would say that it it's worth it to kind of look at these, the way that things these things work and make sure you understand it because like sometimes it feels like it's switched and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So if our command was load word S0 with an offset of 0 and S1, then let's assign our RS and our RT. So RT is this one, and RS is inside the parentheses, that's RS. So if we look at how that gets mapped into memory, RS comes first and RT comes second. So RS comes first, RT comes second. This would be our register, register, opcode, and immediate. So they do kind of get switched. If we remember in the add command, so in this one we have RS and RT in that order. In the add command, it's still RS and RT, but because RD is the one that's getting assigned to, that one comes last. So it that's why I think like calling them source, target, and destination doesn't always work because sometimes it changes because there aren't always three registers. So I would say just try and remember for each type of command how they get mapped. Um, because when you see a command like this, you're going to have to remember which one is RS, RT, and RD anyway. So it, you might as well just try and remember how each command gets mapped directly into memory. Uh, you, you don't necessarily need to know like what these terms mean unless in the chart it gives you like like this type of a, a format but i don't really know what the chart is going to look like so i would say just try and 
Yes. If there is an RT in the uh, instructions, RS and RT are, or like it's going to be RS first and then RT, right? If RD is in there. I don't yeah, I think the only time that you would say like RD is when you have an R type instruction. And in that case, R is not there. Yeah, yeah, you can think of it that way. Like RD is, if you have RD, then that one's going to be last and that one's going to get assigned something kind of. And if you don't have RD, which is the case for these instructions, then it's like uh, RT is getting assigned something. So yeah, that, that's one way to think about it. And these things, they can get really squirrely if you if you get caught up on um, on which is which. So definitely take a look at these things. Give you these. If you added a negative number, would that just be two positive? Yes. Okay. So the first bit is technically assignment. Sort of, yeah. Um, yeah, and that comes up when you do sign extension because this is 16 bits. And so, yeah, if it was a negative number, this bit would be a one. Um, and then you'd have to convert this using two's complement. Okay, so this is the. These are the the simple I type instructions. Now the branches, uh, there's a couple of extra steps for branches. So remember the immediate is going to be some number that's necessary, that's useful for the command. For a branch, that's going to be how far are you jumping? Um, there's two types of branches kind of um, in general. There is an absolute branch and a relative branch. So an, abs or an absolute jump and a relative jump. So an absolute jump, which doesn't exist with these, an absolute jump would say, you give it a memory location and you jump to that memory di location directly. A relative jump, which is what these ones are, is you give it kind of an offset. So you need to you need to know the address that you're on um, before you can go. So the, the example that they give in this slide set is you have a branch extract. So this is your branch instruction. And you're at address 20. OK, so if you're at address 20 and you want to jump, if you branch, you want to go to address 84. So what you need to do is this calculation, 84 minus 20 plus 4. Where 20 represents is, represents the current address. And the plus four is because the first step that happens is the program counter gets inc incremented by four. And we'll see that in a bit. But so what when when the computer is determining whether you branch or not, the program counter is actually at 24, mm. not 20. So like 24 is like the current address when the calculation is happening. So if we decide to jump, the computer needs to know we are here. We need to jump here. So that's 60 more spots. That's 60 addresses in the future. So the immediate would be 60 and not 64. Because the first thing that happens in this single cycle machine is that the program counter gets in, um, incremented. So when you're on when you're executing the instruction on line 20, the program counter will have a 24 in it. And that's where we're getting this uh, this plus four from. So always, always, always when you're doing these these branches, these conditional branches. To figure out the immediate, you use this formula. So the immediate equals your target address minus current address plus four. OK, that's step one. Step two, if you remember, you don't have these last two bits. And the reason is because every address is going to be a multiple of four. And if you think about multiple of four in binary, the first multiple of four is four, which looks like this. Eight is that in binary, which is a four, eight, 12 is just 
one, one, zero, zero. So for all of these multiples of four, you see that the last two bits are zero. So if you're going to be jumping to an address and you know that the last two bits are always zero, then we can discard those bits. And that gives us two extra bits at the top, two extra bits of. Of uh, jump range, I guess. So. For example. In this example, we had. We are at address 20 and we want to jump to address 84. So we do this calculation, we figure out the immediate should be 60. So if we convert 60. To binary. What do we get? 60 is. 32. Plus 16. Plus 8. These two make 48. Uh, plus 8 is 56. Plus 4 is 60. Okay. Math on the fly is always scary. <laughs> so uh, if we if we do our binary counting, this is 32, 16, 8, 4. And then that's 2 and that's 1. So this is 60 in binary, but because no matter what jump we're getting, we're always going to have these two zeros at the end because every single one of these is going to be a multiple of four. So what we can do is cancel out these zeros. The processor knows that they're going to be there and our immediate is just. Just the all but the last two bits. So our actual immediate and you can see right here is. One, 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 one in binary. Um, so what will happen is when the processor reads this immediate, if they figure out that they need to jump, then you'll add on these two zeros. Because you know that they're always going to be there. And then in that way. You don't need to waste these two bits just to say that it's a multiple of four. You can use those two bits to jump um, an extra range of, of addresses. So whereas we, we would have had. 16 bits total. This is 16 bits. If we were using these two bits down here, then we have just these 16 bits. But because we can ignore those two bits, then we get two extra bits of precision, basically, um, that can specify a wider range of addresses to jump to. So this does become a problem sometime. Because this is a relative jump, there's only so far that you can jump. Um, for your class and for your programs, that's not going to be a problem, but in a, in like a real computer, uh, they might need to in, like uh, create kind of a macro for a, a longer jump where you jump to an intermediate address and then you jump further because you only have so much range. OK, so does this make sense? What you have to do is use this formula to calculate what your immediate should be. And then when you actually write it as bits, you drop the last two bits because they're always going to be zero zero. OK. Hmm? So BEQ is you you branch. OK, yeah, that's a good question. So. So if we had B and E. T0. T2. And then like. Uh, so you, you'll see in assembly right here, it says uh, label. So when you're actually writing assembly code, you can kind of just put a label and then that'll be converted into an address implicitly. So this is this is like a, a MIPS assembly program. Um, so you can you can write the label in there and it'll get converted into an address. So really what's there in this command is. Register, register and then some address. So we could say that this is like hex one, four, eight, seven or something. OK. So BNE stands for branch if not equal. So this is saying that we're going to jump to this address if the contents of T0 are not equal to the contents of T2. OK, uh, BEQ is branch if equal. Right, so if we had the same command, but it was a BEQ.
then you'd say if t0 equals t set t2, if the contents of t0 equal the contents of t2, then you do you do that jump. And if it's yeah, if it's false, then nothing happens. So uh, a lot of times, like you, you, this is this is you need to use these for like making for loops and if, and uh, like conditional statements. Really, anytime you want to have like an if condition in assembly, you'll have to like if it's true, then you do this. Otherwise, you're branching, and it's it's kind of complicated. You guys have had to make these kind of programs in your labs, right? Writing assembly. Yeah, I'm sure you know what kind of a pain it can be. Uh, doing something simple like a for loop. You didn't have to make a for loop? Okay. If, <laughs> if you did have to make a for loop, the idea would be... Yeah, pretty much. So, like, you'd have one spot... Huh? Yeah, I think so. I feel like I remember the... Zybox actually has some some good examples. It is like a slightly modified instruction set. Like it's going to be a simpler, a smaller subset of the total MIPS commands. But for what it does, it actually has some really good examples. Yeah, right. So it's a little bit different, but it should it should help you out. Yeah, a, a for loop. Um, you basically have your condition where you'll say like, and and okay. Uh, you might have to do like. So say you wanted to do uh, a for loop going uh, counting from 0 to 10. So you, you would have to store um, that 10 into a register, like call that T4. And this would be like your loop end condition. And then you'd have to have a counter variable. That could be like T3, right? And then what you'd have to do is do whatever logic. And then your check would be like BEQ T4. T3 and then um, end of loop. So basically what this is saying is if your counter has reached your loop termination value of 10, then you jump to whatever happens after the loop. Otherwise, if this if this branch doesn't happen, then this is basically the loop body. And at the end, you'll say jump back to the addition. So yeah, there's examples in Zybooks, and it's really not that complicated um, because it, it's what the computer is doing normally when you write a for loop. But um, it's a lot more. It's a lot more to write, and it's it's a lot less readable, in my opinion. So the last type of instruction, which I think is pretty easy, is just the simple jump instruction. All it has, it's an unconditional jump. These other ones are conditional jumps because you jump only if this condition is met, if there's an equal or a not equal. But the unconditional jump is just J and then your address. Or, or your label, which gets mapped to an address. So, okay, so there's a couple of things that's happening here. Again, we're dropping the last two bits. You don't need to convert it because this is a this is a um, an absolute jump, so you're jumping straight to this address, regardless of where you're at in the code, and because addresses are all multiples of four, you can drop those last two zeros. So we have 26 bits to work with, and they have to be really clever with how to do this because your instruction is 32 bits. Six of them need to be the opcode, absolutely have to be the opcode because you need to have a certain number of commands. So that leaves 26 bits to specify an address anywhere in the computer. Addresses are usually 32 bits. So how can we stuff 32 bits into 26? Well, the first one is we can chop off these two bits because we always know they're going to be zero. So we don't have to write those down. We can add them on later because we know they're going to be there. So that gets us. To 30 bits. And then this is where there's a limitation. Because we only have so many bits, we we need we have 26 bits and we need to store 30. We're just gonna have to drop the top four bits. 
So if you think about the address space, say this is address zero, this is address four maybe, and then this keeps going. They're going to count, and the numbers on the right of the address, the, the least significant address bits, are going to be the ones changing. And the most significant address bits aren't going to change until you get way, way down here. Like this will be address like one, zero, zero, zero. You know, you have to count through all of these addresses. So what we're doing when we're chopping off these four most significant address bits is we're limiting the range that we can jump to to be within the same kind of block that the instruction is in. Because if you imagine that there's 32 bits, so there are, I guess this would technically be a eight bit hex or an eight digit hex number. Okay, imagine the entire space of addresses. What we do when we chop off these top four bits is we can only jump within the block of memory, instruction memory, where we we uh, have the same first four bits. So if the if the instruction that we're on, if if, if this jump instruction is at address hex um, one four zero 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 zero, each hex digit is four bits. So this one is zero 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 one really, and this is the the four most significant bits. So these four bits are going to get copied into your jump label. So if we wanted to jump to, say, address to address 32, 32 in binary is 32, not 16, not 8, not 4, not 2, not 1, right? So this is your number. We can chop off these two bits. So we have one zero zero zero, and then we we know that realistically there's all these zeros out front. So imagine we've written out all these zeros. This is our number thirty two with our two um, bits dropped off. And what happens is we don't have the space to store these top four bits. So this thirty two really has zeros all the way down. What's going to happen when we when we do this jump is we can't store these four most significant zeros. And what we do is we copy the four most significant zeros from the instruction. OK, so this causes a problem. Because if we're at this address and we put a 32, we want to jump to address 32, what's going to get spit out is this address, which is not 32 because this bit is here. So this is another limitation of the architecture. Because we have only uh, 26 bits to store a 32-bit address, there are some cases where you cannot jump to a certain address. But for the most part, it's fine because you have 26 bits to work with. That's a whole lot of bits. That's a lot of instructions. And for small little things like a little for loop, you should be able to jump from the end of the for loop back to the beginning or from the, the condition to the end of the for loop. So that's the reason why you we need to get rid of these four bits because we need to we need to cut some bits somehow. And that's the consequence is there are certain ranges of memory that we cannot exit when we're in a jump. Does that make sense? It's kind of all over the place, but maybe it'll make more sense once you kind of dig into the once we dig into the uh, into the diagram. So these are the three formats of instructions. Any questions on these? Or do you want to go back and do another example? OK, let's let's move on. We can always come back. So. Registers, so registers and register files, that's what we're up to next. Registers, you probably use them. They're like variables. Um, the advantage of using registers for CPU commands and for assembly is because they're right there. The CPU can access them very quickly. So instead of having to go grab the contents of a variable from memory, they're right there. The CPU can access the register file very quickly. So that's why there's um, when you work with assembly, it's very low level, close to the CPU. And that's why our variables are registers, because you're actually accessing the register file. 
and you're not loading things from memory unless you use a load word or a store word. So um, in some cases, it's a little less readable, but with comments, you can sometimes like assign variables. You just have to stick to that yourself. The compiler is not going to tell you that you did something wrong if you type a, a four here instead of a zero. So the register file, uh, you've probably seen this diagram. We'll go into this one and then we'll go into the more complicated ones next. But this is the kind of picture that when you show someone this picture who's not an ECE major, they're going to think like, wow, your major is so hard. And then you tell them, yeah, it is. You're so I'm so smart for understanding this. I love showing people these pictures like you seem you get so much clout for for understanding what this means. So this is a register file. It can be written into and it can be read from. These blocks here are the registers. Everything else is just the hardware so that you can access the registers. But the actual value of register zero will be stored in here, like zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, whatever is in there. It's going to be in this block right here, or it's going to be 32 of those blocks in parallel. So what's happening is. OK, the, the other bit here is the buffer. So this thing's kind of a funny little guy. He has this characteristic. So if your input is X, your output is Y. You have this sideline C, this control line. If your control line is zero, then Y is unconnected. We say it's high Z or high impedance. It's basically like a break in the circuit. So X, X has no path to Y in the case where C is zero. If C is one, then they're directly connected, X, Y. Okay, so that's kind of why the truth table looks like this. High Z is just a term when we say something is disconnected. Okay. Um, so let's trace through what's happening in here. Say we wanted to read the contents of register two. Okay. Reading register two means that we want whatever's in here to end up on this line. OK, and then once we once we've read register two, then we can use it in an add instruction or a subtract or whatever it is. But how do we get to register two? Well, we have these decoders, so decoders as a review. They take in a binary number as input and they have a one hot output. So the binary number that's the input is like which index is going to be one. So one hot remember is where one of these is one and then the rest of them are zero. So say this is our decoder. It's got three inputs and two to the three, which is eight outputs. And that's always the case for a decoder. If it's got n inputs, it's two to the n outputs. So in this case, n is three. OK, and our, if our input is one, one, zero. Or in vertical format, like this is the least significant. This is the most significant bit. One, one, zero. Then what is our output going to be? Well, this is a hex or this is a binary six, right? One, one, zero is four plus two plus zero, which is six. So what this means is that the output line six is going to be one and all the rest of them are going to be zero. And don't forget that these are zero index, so the first one is zero and not one, and that's why the last one is seven and not eight. So the output here. All zeros and then six is a one. So this is how we access memory, and this is how we can have such a big block of memory and only grab a little bit of it. So if you if you understand what a decoder does, let's look at how we can read register two, read the contents of register two. So first of all, if we're reading register two and we're not writing to anything, then write enable is going to be zero. And the enable is awesome because if this is zero, then you can ignore pretty much everything that's happening here because no writing is happening. OK. Um, we are reading, so read enable is going to be one. OK, and we want to get. The contents of register two. So if you look at what's going on with this register two, there's a load. This is, this is like a like a flip flop or a latch or something, right? So if the load signal is high, then whatever is here gets passed and saved inside. If load is zero, then this gets ignored. 
OK, since we're not writing to anything, write and enable is zero. All of these load signals are zero. Nothing can get loaded in. This thing is safe. It's not changing. We're looking at the read side. So regardless of what the load is, the contents of the register are going to be on this line. OK, so you can imagine that the contents of register one are right here. The contents of register two are right here. And our goal was to get the contents of register two onto this line here. So let me let me get a different color. Maybe. So this is the contents. This is where we want the contents of register two to end up. So contents of register two already exist on this line without any control signals or anything. And if we want to get them from this line through this buffer to this one, then this signal needs to be high, this D2 signal. D2 signal is the output output of the decoder. So for D2 to be high, our encoder or decoder inputs have to specify D2. When we have two bits, I1 and I0, we can say that I1 is 1 and I0 is 0. That's a binary 2, and that's going to say that D2 is high. So if D2 is high, then this buffer is going to be open, or it's, it's going to be closed, so this line is going to pass through. And the contents of register 2 have made it to this line. Meanwhile, all the other D signals, the decoder outputs are 0, which means that their buffers are like an open circuit. So the contents of register 3 are not making it to this line. The contents of register 2, or contents of register 1, are not making it to that line. Their only path is through the buffer, and the buffer control signal is 0. So it's disconnected. So in that way, we don't have any overlap. We don't have any competition. None of the other registers are writing onto this line. It's only one of them. There's a direct connection from register two to the to the read data line. So that's a read. Let's look at. Uh, that's kind of like a, a read instruction. So this is just a bigger example, right? If we wanted to. Um, so LI is load immediate. <laughs> I've seen so many bugs recently. Is that a ladybug? There were like two ladybugs in my class this morning and they kept flying in front of the projector and like the shadow would be huge, even though it's so small because they were right up there. <laughs> okay, so load immediate is an instruction that loads this immediate value into this register. And it's really good for um, initializing variables in a program. So for example, when we were talking about making a for loop, if you wanted to have a for loop that counts to 10, you're going to have to load 10 into memory somewhere, and you can do that using load immediate. An alternative is that you might see is if you do an add immediate. So you want to store um, 2022 into T6, you can add T6. And in uh, I think I think in some assembly languages, I don't know if this one has a dedicated zero register, but if there's a register that's always zero, no matter what, then you can use this add immediate instruction. Say T6 equals. But let, let's let's just call this. The zero register, which I, I don't remember if MIPS has one, but. Uh, OK, so if, if, we, if we call this one zero. So T6, we're saying that T6 equals 0 plus 2022. So it has the same effect. You're loading this 2022 into T6. Um, load immediate is just a little bit more concise. So the idea behind load immediate is we're going to be writing a 2022 into T6. So that, that's why I wrote that just as a little example. But this is going to be writing 2022 into T6. So if we want to write, first of all, let's do a little bit of um, oh, that, that, that's a pain. Let's just say that we know what the 32 bits that represent 2022 are, because I feel like we're pretty good at doing binary to decimal calculations by now, right? OK. So let's say that we know what that is. That's going to be on our write data. OK, our goal is to get that into T6, which is down here. Let me get a thinner pen and we'll switch up the colors. So our goal is to get it into here. OK, so. 
this uh, 32 is going to come through all of these. And if you notice, these these are like buffers that don't have a control signal. So they're just going to be the only way that the only reason that they're there is to kind of like reassert the signal integrity. Um, I, I would say don't worry about them too much. So these ones that have a control signal, they matter because they're going to either be open or closed. But these ones, uh, this 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 uh, right data is going to be on all of these lines simultaneously. OK, so you can imagine that whatever this uh, this this 32 bit number is. It's at the doorstep of all of these uh, registers. It's ready to get let in as soon as they open up the door. And they open up the door when the low sig load signal is high. So if we want to load it into T6 and no other one. Then we want D6 to be one and all of these other ones to be zero. If we want the output of this decoder, D6 to be one, then the inputs have to be a binary six because it's D6. So if our if we have I2, I1, and I0, those are our three bits. And we want this to be a binary six, that's one, one, zero. So our inputs here would have to be one, one, zero. And that would cause this output of the decoder. So this one is saying we're going to load into T6 and we're going to not load into all the other ones. So this 32 bit number is here waiting to get into T6. We set the load signal high at the next rising clock edge. The contents of T6 are loaded with this 32 bit number. OK, and if we wanted to read that, then we would do the same process as before. Where after it gets loaded in, then that uh, 2022 is sitting on this line. And if we wanted to read it, we would have to say, I want the read address to be 110. That's going to set D6 to be 1, all the rest of these to be 0. OK, that uh, closes, closes the switch in this uh, buffer. So this 2022 can pass through to this line. All the other buffers are going to be open. So it comes out the other side on the read data. So that's if we if we were to read it after we've already loaded it. So we wanted to access that 2022 again, but so really like it's not that complicated. There's just a whole lot of the same thing happening. There's there's basically all of this circuitry is for each of these registers, but it's the same circuitry each time. And because of the way that this is structured, only one register can be accessed at a time. Right? You can only write to one register at a time. You can write to one and then read from a different one at the same time. So what that would look like is say we wanted to. We wanted to load uh, into. Register six and read from register two. So our. We want to read from register two. So our read address would have to be a binary two, which is zero one zero. OK, that means this one is going to have a one. All the rest of them are going to have zeros. That closes this switch. So the contents of T2 can pass through and all the other ones are open, so they do not pass through. OK, and we're still loading in this T6. That's still happening. But meanwhile, we're also reading T2 and that ends up on our read data line. OK, so it is possible in these register files to read and write at the same time, and. That's. That happens, especially when you get into pipelining, which did you guys talk about pipelining? OK. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end. I don't think it's a huge topic on this exam. It might just be like a hey, this is possible, but you'll get into that in a computer architecture. So uh, this is register files. The other example is. But so like the read that one where you say the reads and writes at the same time, like if you're writing something to T6 and at the same time reading something. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and that's fine because it's kind of separate hardware to do the read and the write. So in that case, we would have the read enable is one and the write enable is one. OK, the other this one's very complicated looking, but it's really the exact it's the exact same. Um, the exact same uh, hardware, 
just there's two different reads. And this is actually what you're going to see in the, the MIPS architecture because you have three registers. For an R-type instruction, you'll have like add T1, T2, T3. So what this add instruction is doing is it's going to store T2 plus T3 into T1. So what this takes is it's going to have to read the contents of T2, read the contents of T3, add them up, and then write them to T1. Yeah, exactly. They go off screen and they come back. So that's why it, they'll sh that's why they're showing you this two read register file is because um, you're going to have to do two reads at the same time, but it's it's the same thing. Um, they don't interact with each other at all. All you have is a separate enable signal for each. So say we want to read. Um, let's say R1 is going to be T6. R2 is T3. So both of our read enables are going to be one. R1 address is six. R2 address is three, which is zero one one. So the, all the same logic still happens. You see, all we're doing is kind of splitting this line into two. And it's going to show up at this buffer and it's going to show up at this buffer. So these nodes are connected, but they don't interact with each other at all. Um, it's the same thing copied twice. You could have three or four or five or six reads all happening at the same time. You would just need three or four or five or six decoders. Um, so it looks complicated, but I, it's really actually the exact same thing. Uh, this dotted line just means that like this is not actually running through. It's just for visualization to show that this line is the same as this line. So the same steps happen, the same read, decoding, buffers, enabling, all of that still happens. So that kind of brings us to um, the processor design. So I think, uh, oh, did I not put a picture? OK, so this is like the, the processor, right? And it's got all the parts to it. So if we look at the parts individually, the CPU has the 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 ALU. So the ALU is kind of what's doing the calculations, the adds and the subtraction, everything. You have your memory, which has instruction and data memory. And I think for the case of this, you have instruction memory over here and data memory over here. They're separate. Um, so that's called a, a Harvard architecture, where you have separate memories for. Uh, separate memories for data and instructions. And a von Neumann architecture is where you have the same the same memory block, um, and it can be either data or instructions. So you, you'll see often like your computer is a von, Neum von Neumann architecture, um, but sometimes for like embedded systems, smaller things, you'll have a Harvard architecture. Um, it's a little bit simpler to understand, and I think that's why they, they use this for, for the MIPS um, processor. Um, you have peripherals, which can, which can do interrupts. Did you guys talk about interrupts? OK, interrupts are part of this exam. OK. Yeah, I because I, I don't think it was on the slides. I, they kind of changed this topic. OK, so we can talk about interrupts a little bit. So the program counter, remember, it's always going to point to the next instruction. So you have your instructions in memory. These are all memory addresses. And your program counter is going to say, I am executing this instruction. And there's a big decoder where you put in the uh, you put in the uh, the address and out spits the contents of that address. And, and this is the, the program counter. And then as soon as you've gotten this this instruction, this is going to be 32 bits. Then your program counter goes, OK, I'm going to go look at the next instruction while we're executing this one. So that's what the program counter does. It's always storing the address of the next instruction. And then when you read from that address, you're actually getting the bits that make up that instruction, the ones in the zeros for the opcode and the registers. So 
remember the the reason that we're always doing PC plus four is because instructions are 32 bits. So if you have 32 bits. Each word size is eight bits. So you can kind of imagine that the width is 32. But each width is broken into. Eight bits. Eight bit chunks. So each one of these chunks has an address. This could be address zero. This could be hex. One. This one could be hex two. And this one could be hex three. But because our instructions are 32 bits. We're never going to start looking at this instruction or this this group of bits. We're always going to stay kind of aligned to these multiples of four. So this constitutes one instruction, even though it's like four groupings. It's just one instruction. So the next possible instruction would not be at hex zero one or it would not be at one, two or three, but it would be at the next group of four. Which starts at. Hex four. So that's why we're doing PC plus four each time, but because because our addresses are actually um, these addresses exist, these intermediate non multiple four addresses exist, but they're never going to be the start of an instruction. And your program counter is always going to point to the start of the instruction. So that's why we do these these this PC plus four each time. Does that make sense? All right, it, it's a little weird to wrap your mind around sometimes, um, but there's a reason for all of these things. And when you get into computer architecture, you may have to design your own processor and you're definitely going to get familiar with why these decisions were made because you'll deal with the consequences of not making them that way. So aligning everything nicely into multiples of four makes it easy because then you can drop those two bits in your jump instructions because you know it's always going to align properly. You're never going to have any overlap because one instruction is going to take up this bit. One instruction will never be. Like these four blocks. Right, it's going to be 32 bits starting from a multiple of four address. OK, so that's the program counter. The ALU, um, it takes in two inputs and it can do some sort of mathematical operation. So what this thing is going to look like. It'll have its two inputs, which are 32 bit strings. They could be data. They could be the contents of a register or in the case of a branch instruction. Remember our branches. We had uh, an offset. So the, the address that we're jumping to is. Uh, let's look at this. So for this branch instruction, remember we're at address 20 and we want to jump 60 spots forward. So what's going to happen is there's going to be an, an add operation. That takes this 60 in. And then it calculates this 84 again. Uh, so that it knows which address to go to. And it's going to do that by adding the, the program counter, the current program counter to this 60 to get this 84 back. So even if the instruction isn't an add instruction, the ALU might be doing an add operation to calculate that instruction. And bear with me because that's kind of confusing, but another example is your load word. So if you remember this, um, this is going to take whatever is stored in here. Plus the offset. So. Contents of T4. Plus offset. Which is this guy. And this is the memory location. That we're going to read, so this is a memory location. We're going to get the contents of that memory location. And store it into T2. That's what a load word is doing. This is calculating the address. So we're saying whatever is stored in T4, we want that address plus four. And we're going to load load that into T2. So this T contents of T4 plus offset, that's an add operation that's going to happen whenever you do a load word command. Even if you're not offsetting it at all, and even if you don't think about there being an add in a load word. 
the ALU is going to add two numbers together, and it's going to be the t contents of T4 and the offset. OK, so the ALU is very important, um, and it sometimes has output of flags, which I don't think you really need to know about, so we can skip those. The sign extender. Um, so this is useful for the immediate type instructions where you have a 16 bit immediate, but you want to add it to the contents of a register, for example. So an add immediate. T2, T3, 48. This is going to say I want the I want to do. The contents of T3 plus 48 and store that into. T2. So these registers are 32 bits. They, they hold 32 bits. So this is going to be 32 bits. But this immediate field, if we look back at how we set up our instructions, we only have 16 bits. Sorry, this is more like it. We only have 16 bits to store the immediate. So if we want to add them together, we need to make sure it's a 32 bit number added to a 32 bit number. And the way that we do that is. Is by padding it with the sign extender. So if we look at 48. 48 as a 16 bit number. 48 is what? Uh, 32 plus 16, not 8, not 4, not 2, and not 1. So we look at this in groups of 4. So this is 16 bits representing the number 48. And if we pass this through the sign extender, they're going to, then we're going to add four more groups of four zeros at the start. So it's going to become a 32 bit number. Now, like you said, if this was a negative number and we were using two's complement, say our number was negative uh, 48. All right, so to calculate negative 48, here's our 48. We'd flip all the numbers, we'd flip all the bits. And then add one. I guess I kind of cheated there because I started from the left, but this is a uh, negative 48. OK, we flipped all the bits and then we added one. That's two's complement. So this negative 48, you see in the in the 16 bit format, it has a one. So you know this is a negative number. So what the sign extender is going to do is going to add. All ones out to the front, so this is still negative 48. It's just got more leading ones, just like how this is still 48 with a bunch of leading zeros. OK, all the sign extender is doing is just making sure that the numbers are the same amount of bits so that they're compatible for operations in the ALU because the ALU is taking two 32 bit numbers. Oh, and if you haven't seen this, this notation before, um, this little slash is just saying instead of one wire, there's actually 16 wires bundled together. Um, but it's a lot more compact to just say that this is 16 bits and then think of it kind of as a single pipe that's carrying all 16 bits. Um, and if it doesn't have a slash, then it's usually just a single bit. OK, um, any questions about these guys, the, the PC, the ALU and the sign extender? OK, so. If we kind of put it all together. Um, I guess I'm not sure how much experience you have with this diagram. Have you gone through and said, here's an instruction, turn it into bits and then figure out where all the bits flow? Have you done that kind of stuff? OK, OK, that's important and it kind of puts everything together. So um, we can do an example of that. Um, Word. Yeah. This control? Yeah. So the control is going to be. Control represents a bunch of signals that are like. Um, control signals, so so what this is going to do is it's going to take in. So if you see what happens here. Here, let's uh, let's copy down an instruction. Let's say that the the instruction that we want to do is. I want to make sure that this has the hardware for it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do an add instruction. So. Um, oh, you know what? I think I might have lied to you before. Uh, 
when when we were talking about registers and I was converting these registers to binary, uh, I'm pretty sure all of the registers have this like extra one in this spot. Um, and then whatever it is, yeah, yeah. So ignore what I said earlier, but it, it, if you look at um, like RT, this would be zero one zero zero one. Okay, perfect. Then, yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's where like in some thing, like when you look at other architectures, like it doesn't do that. So it's, but as long as you know for this exam, you're gonna need to know this one. So just don't get caught up on that. Um, but in general, right, you're just taking the binary number. So let's, actually let's, let, let, you can do this one. Let's do a, a more complicated one, maybe one that isn't done for us. So let's do a sub. So let's say we're going to subtract. Um, we're going to store this into T3, and it's going to be T4, T1. So this is going to say, I want to store into T3, T4 minus T1, right? So, OK. So there's a whole lot that goes on, but step one is let's get this instruction into bits. So you'll have a table for this. I don't, I don't think I have the same table that you have, but it, it, it should be the same table. So if we look at our sub instruction, right here, Fact, let me just copy this to a new page so we don't run into that problem again. OK. So. We're going to do a sub instruction and we said it was. What? Ah, OK, let's just rewrite it. OK. So the subtract function looks like this RD RS RT. It's an R type instruction. So this is our RD RS and RT. And when we flip it into bits, this is how the string looks like. This is our opcode. This is shift, which is not important. But these are always going to be zeros. And this is our function code. OK. So these things will be probably given to you in some table. So if we look at our instruction, this is our instruction. We're going to start with one, two, three, four, five, six. This is opcode or sub. And then we have five bits for our RS, five bits for our RT, and five bits for our RD. And then we'll have one, two, three, four, five bits of zeros for the shift. One, zero, 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 one, zero for our function code. OK. So we figured out RD is T3, RS is T4, and RT is T1. So RD goes here. T3 would be zero, one, and then a binary three, which is one, one, zero. But no. 0, 1, 1. Okay, that's our RD. This is T3. RS is T4, which is 0, 1, and then a binary 4, which is 1, 0, 0. And RT is T1, which is 0, 1, and then a binary 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So we put it all together. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. OK, have you guys done the thing where you turn this back into hex? This can be kind of useful if you want to write this instruction. I don't know if it's important, but it'll only take a second. So 
If you want to turn this into a hex number, then you group these by fours. Or did I mess up? Six, five, five. Third one. Oh, this guy. Okay. Uh, so four, 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 four. Yeah. So th this. That's the nice thing is you know that if you uh, if it doesn't match up, then you've done something wrong. There we go. Because there should be eight groups of four. Okay, and now you can go left to right. It doesn't matter. All zeros is this is going to be the hex number. This is a hex zero. This is a hex one. One zero zero zero. What is that in hex? Eight. One zero zero one. That's a nine. Zero one zero one. What's that? Five. One zero zero zero. That's another eight. Zero zero one zero is a two. And that's another two. So this would be our instruction in hex. Um, if you ever have to write it out, you'll probably write that instead of writing all the zeros and the ones. But when it comes to the processor, it's going to be seeing those zeros and ones. So this is just kind of an exercise. So let's look at our okay, our single cycle processor, which it's called single cycle because you'll notice only one clock cycle happens. And it's kind of weird to think about how else would it be until you see a multi-cycle processor. But for right now, you can kind of think of everything is kind of happening at the same time. Once you load everything, then it immediately passes through the ALU, gets calculated, and then when the next clock cycle happens, the storage happens. So it's kind of just like one clock cycle for all the computation to happen. OK, so we've got our instruction in here. And what happens is whenever we're executing this sub instruction, which is Whenever we're executing this sub instruction, then copy the bits too. Okay, it's going to get loaded from instructions memory. So IR thirty one zero. What this notation means is basically the instruction register bits thirty one to bit zero. So if you have 32 bits, this is bit 0, and this is bit 31. Altogether, that's 32 bits because it starts from 0. OK, so this represents this line has all 32 of those bits. 31 to 26, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26. These ones are your opcode. They go into your control. So what the control block is going to do, it's going to take in your opcode and figure out how all the muxes need to be set and what's the ALU operation. You don't need to know what the inside of that looks like, but you need to know that it's going to take in the opcode and some logic, some combinatorial logic inside of it is going to figure out based on that opcode, I want certain data lines to go in certain places. So let's I like to assign these data lines once we come to them. So let's get a let's get a Purple, I think, would look nice. OK, bits 25 to 21. This is uh, 31 to 26. This is 25 to 21, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. Bits 25 to 21 are RD address. So if we remember when we said RD is T3. Oh, wait, that's oh, no, sorry, read one address. So these bits here are 25 to 21 or rs so we figured out that those bits are going to be 0, 01 100 0, 0, because this is talking about t4 okay with me so far you guys have seen this i'm sure you've walked through this before but just another example is always good so these bits are that 0, 01 1, 0, 0. this is the register file we're going to Basically, on a much larger scale, do exactly what we did here, where the address now is 01100, and it's going to load the contents of that register. So that is going to happen inside the register file. 20 through 16 
would be these bits. This is 20 and 16. That's our next one. That's uh, T R. Or, uh, this is T4, T1, and that's 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So for subtract instruction, we've got two reads happening, and the data is going to come out. That's the contents of whatever's in those registers. So we don't really know what that is. But we do know that for the subtraction to happen, we need the contents to appear on both of these. So the contents of T4 need to make it to this line, and that's nice because it happens directly. The contents of T1 need to show up here. So that means that here's the contents of T1. It's on this line. It's going to go into this spot of the MUX. So this MUX is also receiving the sign extended immediate. If we had an immediate instruction, bits 15 to 0, that's the last 16 bits of the instruction. So this would be the immediate if this were an immediate type instruction. But why is it a capital I? Uh, I think it's just convention. It's just what you what you do. So, uh, like the first 16 digits or something? Yeah, so it's, uh, we look at. Yeah, so the reason if you look at this is what the instruction looks like, you know, it's if we lay out all the bits like this for this would be like a like a load word and add immediate instruction. These are the last 16 bits of the instruction. The index of this bit is bit zero. And if we were to count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this most significant is bit 15. And it's kind of weird because it starts at 0. It's not bits 1 through 16. It's bits 0 through 15. But it's still 16 bits, and it's these 16 bits. So if there was an immediate, yeah, it's for a different type. And, and how this happens is, these bits are still going to be populated, like on this line, are still going to be these first 16 bits. Because at this point, the processor doesn't know which instruction it's doing. For you. you might be doing a, a, a load word instruction. So really what's on this line are these hex 5822. That's 16 bits. Okay, So that's here. And that'll get sign extended, whatever that means. This might be garbage. Whatever's on this line might be garbage. OK, so this MUX has to choose between the contents of T1 and the sign extended immediate. And. Yeah, right. If this, yeah. So if there was an add immediate, then this would be useful information and this would be garbage because we don't have a, a second read register. So one of them is going to be garbage. So like. Like 15. You would not. Are you talking about this one? Um, yeah, so so this is saying that if we're writing to an address. So. Uh, we'll get to that when we get to writing. So for now, let's ignore this mux and we'll focus on this one. So this mux, right, it has to choose. It has to choose this line. Which means that its select line here has to be a one. So this is where if the subtract if the opcode is for subtraction, then this MUX control line, which is ALUS, is going to be a one. But if it was an add immediate or a load word or something where this immediate is is useful information, then it would be a zero. So the control struct, the control block is going to look at the opcode and figure out this MUX selection. It's also going to do that for all the other ones. So we've now gotten the contents of both registers into this ALU. The other thing is this ALU control is going to tell this thing to do subtraction mode. OK, and that might look like any number of things, depending on what the ALU is. So do you guys remember seeing that combined adder subtractor circuit? It was like four half adders um, or four adders kind of chained together. And then you had like a add subtract bit. And if the add subtract bit was one, then it did it. XORed all of the second arguments, um, 
I think we actually have it. This thing right here. So this this control bit was controlling whether the A and B were getting added or subtracted. So this thing has different modes that it can do, and based on the mode, add or subtract, it has a different arithmetic result. Just like that, the ALU has many, many, many different things. It could do addition, multiplication, subtraction, division. So this ALU control is going to have to tell the ALU that we're in subtraction mode. And that's also going to come from this control section. So ALU op operation, we don't really know what the ALU structure looks like. Um, so I'm not sure. Did your did your professors like tell you what ALU op should be in bits, or did you just kind of write like subtract? Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, yeah, we either roll FC add or subtract. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, what what's gonna what, what this what bits are gonna be on this line depends on what the ALU looks like, and we haven't really gotten a peek inside the ALU, so yeah, just subtract. But there's some bits that represent a subtraction operation are gonna come here, telling the ALU to do subtract mode. So it's gonna subtract these two numbers, and the result is gonna be here. Now remember, our subtract instruction is saying we're gonna store that result into register three. We're not storing it into memory. We're storing it into register three. So we want our write enable. This is writing to data memory. That's going to be zero. We're not writing anything to data memory. We're just writing to the register file. So write enable is zero. Read enable is also zero. We're not reading anything from the register file. Excuse me, register file. So the ALU result is on this line. OK. And we want it to get here. We want to write that data to the register file. So the way that it gets there is we have to have this mux choose a zero. So that that comes from RFWDS. Uh, RF register file write data select. We want that to be a zero. Some of these names are meaningful and some of them are just kind of a mess. What matters is that this mux is selecting a zero and you can see that you want the ALU's results to pass through to this output line. This output line comes all the way back and gets written into the register file. Okay, so now what we have is if these bits are set correctly, so read enable is zero, write enable is zero. It generally, if you're not going to read or write from memory, you want the enables to be zero so that you don't accidentally read or write from memory. Okay, so we've got our result is right here. Um, so uh, say uh, T4 had 16 and maybe T1 had 7. 16 minus 7 is 9. There'd be a 9 on this line. That's coming into write data. So the next thing we want to have happen is we want that 9 to enter into T3. So our write address is either Close this up. So while we were doing all this reading stuff, these other bits were happening. So 15 to 11, bits 15 to 11, what are those? Here was bit 16, so 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. These are 15 to 11, and that's our RS. Or not our RS, our uh, RD. Okay, this is actually how the bits are laid out. So this is register three or T3, right? These are the bits from our instruction. So bits 15 to 11, they represent the address of T3, and we want to write to that address. So our choice is between bits 20 and 16 and 15 and 11. If we were to choose this top path, that would be for those instructions like in add immediate, where we only have two registers. So the first register is getting read from and the second register is being written to. In this instruction, we have three registers. Two of them are getting read from and one of them is getting written to. So we don't want this path. We want the T3 bits 15 to 11 to pass through. So we want this control line to be zero. If we trace that back, that's RF write address select. Whatever that means, that's a zero. So these bits for T3 gets passed into the write address. So what our register file is seeing 
if we look back at the register file, our write address is now one, or sorry, zero one, zero one one. That's T three. Okay. And our write enable, our write enable is going to be one because we do want to write the result to the to the register file. So that just comes right here. Write enable is one. Write address is the address of T3. It's passed through this mux. And the write data is the result, which is nine. So once all of that is good, then the next clock cycle happens. And whatever data is sitting right here gets written to that address specified by the write address. So that's that's everything that needs to happen. And when you kind of work through it, you figure out what the control signals need to be. So you don't have to memorize for a subtract. This mux is one, this mux is zero. You don't need to memorize those. You can kind of work through it if you know where the data is going to flow and which path needs to go from the input to the output. So it was a different type of instruction, right? Like if it was an add immediate, then this immediate would have been important. So we would want to pass that immediate through to the ALU. Um, in the other case, if we look at this mux here, when would we want this bit to come on? So if we're reading data from memory, like in a uh, load word. A load word is going to take data from memory and store it into a register. So in that case, uh, we would be reading data. That data would come out here. We would want this mux to select this one. And then the data from memory would end up on the right data, and we would write that to the register. So that would be a load word command. So depending on the command, these muxes are going to behave a little bit differently. But that's all going to be figured out by this control block. So once you can kind of trace the path of everything, then you'll figure out what these bits need to be. And uh, and yeah, just don't lose track of anything. But it's really not that complicated. It definitely looks a lot more complicated than it is. Does this make sense? Do you feel like you could trace through an instruction like this for your exam? Because I I guarantee you will. <laughs> I will, I guarantee it'll be on your exam. Um. Okay, so that's the processor design. So the data memory is like um, is like your hard drive. That's where you're saving things like variables and or, or it could be like your RAM or whatever. Your register file is very small amount of data. It's just those registers and it's very close to the CPU. The CPU can grab them very quickly, do operations on them and put them back. Data memory takes a little bit of time for the load or to, to load and to store into it. It's actually the longest instruction in a single second machine for execution time. But data memory is like if you were to store. Um, so if you talked about like store word and and load word, oops, store word and load word, um, you're going to have your data memory. And you're going to have some addresses. A zero. And there's going to have some data in it. Right? And that's kind of for like uh, variables and stuff. And if you wanted to grab this data, you'd have to do, let's say I wanted to take this data and put it into T4. So you'd have to do load word T4, and then from the address 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, after this instruction executes, the contents, whatever's in here, say this is like four, nine, six, seven, some data. It's loaded into T4, and now it's saved in the register file. So now if you want to do an add, or maybe an add immediate, T4, T4, and then 10, what this is going to do is it's going to read the contents of T4, add 10, and then store the results back into T4. So in order for this to happen, we would need the contents of T4 to be whatever we want to do. And you can grab that stuff from memory. Remember, you only have so many registers, right? There's maybe like eight registers that you can work with, but you have a whole lot more memory. So say you had some some assembly program where you needed to have a certain number of variables active. Um, and maybe you have something in register T4 that you don't need to use. Then you can store it in data memory. 
And then you can reuse this register T4 for some other calculation. You could use that as a counter for a while loop or something. And then the next time you need that value again, you can grab it back from data memory and store it in one of your precious few registers. So data memory is kind of where you store stuff that you're not immediately using, where your register file is where it's stuff that's happening right now. Um, and, that, and that's the difference. And you would, anytime you want to access data memory, you have to use either a load or a store. Whereas for the, the register file, it just automatically reads from it. Like we didn't have to tell it, okay, for this add instruction, first read the data from T4 and then use it to add. When we said T4, it's just going to immediately grab the contents of it from the register file. So the register file is, the file is a little bit quicker. Any other questions on this, this diagram or this process? What that might be is it might be saying that that's instructing is on the line system. But it's not really clear. Right? That's why I assume it might be a typo. Oh. But I, it might be saying that that instruction is on line 16. So what that looked like is, is it kind of looked like this. It said like 16 and then the instruction. But yeah, there's never going to be an opcode or anything before. Like the, This is golden. Like this is actually how every instruction is going to be. It's going to be opcode, and then this bit changes, but it's always going to start with the opcode for all of these. If you look at any of these, like even the even the jump instruction starts with the opcode. Okay. Um, any other questions on processor design? Did you guys look through? Like this was in in the the slides that Dr. Cook sent me. Have you guys gone through this? Okay, so let's talk about some of these because these might be questions on your exam. I, I don't know, but they're definitely good things to know. So why is this architecture called a single cycle architecture? Hmm. So oh, let's 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 first talk about pipelining for just a second. So if you if we look at what happened in this uh, in this process um and so you remember like your 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 um your, your flip-flops or your latches or whatever it, it takes a clock pulse in order for whatever's saved in there to change um on the rising edge of the clock whatever's on the input goes through the output so the only time that you're doing like a, a read or anything is uh from these register files, you're going to be loading something or storing something into the register file that takes a single clock pulse. So this is a single cycle machine because because um, this whole process takes basically a single a single cycle of the CPU. Things like uh, whenever when we read this data, it fed through the ALU. The ALU immediately calculated the result because the ALU doesn't require a clock. The ALU is something like a combination of logic circuit, where once the inputs are there, the only time that it takes is whatever kind of propagation delay or capacitance is inside those logic gates. But it's not like your AND gate requires a clock cycle to take the input and calculate the result. The ALU is the same way. Once the inputs are there, the output is just basically instantly on the output. In the same way, this output is instantly on this MUX. This MUX already has the control bit, so this output is immediately back at the input. So the second we load everything, all of the stuff gets calculated and it's back at the input, ready to get stored on the next clock pulse. So that's a single clock cycle that it takes to do all those calculations. And that's really nice because we don't need multiple clock cycles when we can do it all in one cycle. The idea behind pipelining, though, is we break each instruction into different steps. So we instruction fetch, decode, execution, memory access, and memory data write back. So what that looks like is maybe if I can get a clean version of this guy. What that looks like is kind of it's kind of broken into stages like this. 
So like this is your instruction fetch where you're going to grab the instruction from instruction memory. This is kind of where you're decoding the instruction. You're splitting it up into different groups of bits. And then oh, what's what's the next one? Register, yeah, register fetch and then instruction execution. This is like your execution stage where you're calculating the results. This is your memory access stage where you're reading or writing to data memory. And then the last stage is kind of this bit where you're writing back to the register file or you're writing back to memory. So if you break it up into stages like this, then what you can do is say, once one instruction is in the instruction memory, we're going to fetch it from memory. And then each one of these vertical lines basically represents a line of flip flops. So when you have the inputs, they only pass through on a clock pulse and then the, in the inputs go to the outputs. So it's kind of like whatever's happening over here doesn't affect what's happening here until the clock pulse or whatever's here gets passed through on the clock pulse and then whatever's here gets passed through on the next clock pulse. So it takes like five clock pulses for whatever bits are here to travel through to this stage. OK, but the advantage behind that is it takes five clock cycles to do what this thing could do in a single cycle. The advantage, though, is say you have a processor that can go five times faster than this thing. Then what you can do. And this this is the benefit of pipelining is Say we have all the information for an add instruction here. The add instruction is getting loaded, and then we get the add registers. Once the information for the add registers is here, we can start loading the next in instruction. Say this is a, a subtract. OK, once these add registers get all red and everything, we can move to uh, the execution stage for the add instruction. And you don't really have to understand how all this works. This is a computer architecture, but the advantage is you can break this into different steps and then you can do those steps overlapping. So that's the idea behind pipelining. This would be a multi cycle machine where you have one cycle for each stage of execution. And when one instruction is in one stage, you can have another instruction in another stage and another instruction in another stage. Yeah. Wait yes, exactly. So that's actually kind of a problem. And so if you have something like that, that's where. Um, oh, let me see if I have. So the, the slide that. We have for pipelining is kind of like this. This is in a single cycle machine where you do all of the tasks and then only then do you move on to the next instruction. Pipelining looks like this. Each group is, is represented by a different symbol. And you're absolutely right, though, say we're going to calculate a result. It's going to take five cycles to get that result. In the next instruction, we want to use that result. We're going to have to add some sort of delays or, or like blank instructions. And so the compiler will take care of that. It'll notice when you have two instructions right next to each other that rely on each other, and it'll add like no operations. Or sometimes it'll rearrange instructions that can be done. Compilers are really smart, but yes, absolutely right. So that's one of the disadvantages of pipelining is it makes it a little more complicated to figure out which instructions go where, but it can save you time. Like if you just look at this picture, doing all of these tasks, um, this is just like laundry, right? It's kind of a, a, a good example. You can save a whole lot of time if your tasks can parallelize well. But okay, this was all in service of answering the question, why, why is this architecture called a single cycle architecture? Because it, everything gets done in a single cycle, as opposed to a multi-cycle machine where you could have you can implement pipelining in this cycle. You can't really do pipelining because everything's in a single cycle. And uh, one of the other disadvantages is um, some instructions take more cycles than others. So for example, the any anything that needs to do with memory, it has to do like this extra memory step. Whereas something like a like a branch and a jump is really easy. A jump instruction, all you have to do is load the address or like decode the instruction, load the address, and then jump to that instruction. It's very quick. So if you break it up into different steps, then you don't need to take all five steps for each instruction. You can save yourself some time that way. In a single cycle machine, every instruction takes the same amount of time because 
it's all just a single clock cycle. So that's why it's a single cycle machine. OK, what is the difference between instruction and data memory? Instruction memory has instructions. Data memory has data. So your instruction memory is going to have things like your opcodes and your registers and all that. And your data memory is going to have like your variable values that you're storing for later. Where does the program counter point? So the program counter points to the next instruction to execute. It's the next instruction that it's going to grab. Um, it, it kind of so like at the start. When we looked at. When you look at this image. Basically, the first thing that happens is. The program counter is here. That's the instruction of that's the address of the instruction that we're grabbing. That's the address of the sub instruction. It goes into this thing to get decoded and grab the address at the same time. It's going into this adder and it's getting incremented by four. So there's a plus four here all the time and then the address is here and what comes out is PC plus four. So the program counter holds the address of the next instruction to grab. Um, why does the CPU need a sign extender? Um, that's so that we can have things like 16 bit immediates being added or subtracted with the contents of registers or memory, which are 32 bits. So you need to make sure that everything is, is, is can, can fit on the same wires. How is a branch address calculated? So for branch address, remember we have um, say we're on address. We're on address. 72. We want to jump to. To address. Uh, 100. OK, so what we do first is we're on address 72. So the program counter is going to have 72 plus 4 equals 76 in it. The. The, the immediate for the branch instruction is going to be 100 minus 76, which is. 24. In binary, we drop off the last two zeros because we know that 24 is a multiple of four. It's always going to happen that way. OK, and then the reverse process happens when you're calculating the address to jump to from the immediate. So the first thing you'll do is so say 24 is our number. 24 is 16 plus 8, not 4, not 2, not 1. OK, so the immediate is going to be just this bit. What it's going to do is. OK, this one does not have the hardware for the branch instructions, but the branch instruction would be something like. It'll be in the immediate. It'll get passed. Uh, somewhere up here where it adds on those two extra zeros. And. It adds these two extra zeros on. And then it sign extends it to be um, the correct. Address it'll so since this was a 24, what we have to do is first add on these two zeros to get this to be a 24, and then we do. 76, which is the current program counter. Plus 24. That's 100 and then this gets fed into the PC. So that's what actually happens when you're doing this, these branch instructions is uh, you have to calculate the new address using this uh, this immediate field. OK, what is the role or how is a jump address calculated for the jump? The, the, the regular jump instruction, you just have to add the two zeros on. Um, oops, instruction formats. So you have to add the two zeros on the bottom and copy the top four bits from the top. That's that's how a jump instruction gets calculated because we have to make some sacrifices to fit this into 26 bits. Uh, what is the role of the ALU controller in an R type instruction in an I type instruction? So the ALU controller is going to tell it which operations to do. In an R type instruction, it's going to say something like add or subtract in an I type instruction. I guess it depends on the instruction in the ones where you have an offset like a load or a store word. You're going to have the offset plus whatever the, the base address is. Um, how is the ALU used in load and store instructions? Let's again, look at the diagram. And I can erase all this pipelining nonsense. 
in load and store instructions, remember we have an offset. Like load word T4. We could have an offset here. T7. So this is going to do the contents of T7 plus four, and that's the address that we're going to read from memory. So the ALU is used to calculate the address that we're going to read from memory in the load and the store instructions. Um, why is a MUX needed at the register block write address? WA and Zybox. These ones you just have to look at the diagram. So at the register block write address. That's down here. That's this MUX. Remember, if we're having like we saw a sub command where we needed to store this store into this one. If our if our instruction was an add immediate. OK, if this was our instruction. Then the immediate would come here, get sign extended. Um, T2 would get read from. This mux would select the immediate value. The address or the the computation would happen. It gets selected here. This is the result from the ALU. And then this would come back to the write data. Now, which address do we, which address do we want to write to? We want to address, we want to write to T4, which is these bits here. So in those in those commands where we only have two registers and we're going to write to one of them, then this mux is going to be at the one. Only in the case when we have three registers and we're writing to one of them does the bottom one get selected. So you don't really have to know these things off the top of your head, but if you can look at this diagram and figure out in which cases the mux would go one way or the other, then you can answer these types of questions. And I don't really know if these like these are going to be multiple choice or anything on your exam, or you're going to see something like that. But if you understand these, then you're pretty good at understanding everything else. Question? So this, I think it's 20 to 16. Those always go to read to that. It just doesn't always get used again, right? Uh, it's like hardwired. To yeah, like these ones. Yeah. Right, exactly. And in that case, in that case, this is like your your read one, read two. The, those bits are hard coded right here, but the enable might just be set to zero for that one. And if it's not, then what happens is even if the enable is not conditionally changing, then these bits show up here no matter what. Like whatever bits are here, that could be garbage. It could be part of your anything. They'll show up here. But if we're not writing anything to data memory, and maybe we in, in that case, we would have an immediate, then this mux is going to get selected. These bits just kind of go nowhere. They fizzle out. So it, it depends on whether there's actually that like two read enable bits, but either way it should be fine. Um, why is a mux needed on one of the ALU inputs? If we look at that mux. Remember that mux is deciding whether we're going to add the second read register or we're going to add the immediate or subtract or multiply or whatever the ALU is doing. It's deciding between the immediate or the uh, the second register. And why is a mux needed between data memory and the register block? So that mux, if you're reading from data, maybe say for a load, a load word, you're loading something from data that's going to come out right here, and you need that to end up at the register block, then you select this path. But if you're going to load, or if you're going to store the ALU results into the register file, then you're going to take the bottom path. So Eric, would uh, the mux for write v1 on the far right, right yeah on the register block yeah so that would be one if we had a load word instruction yeah the one like the 26 oh wait you mean you this one this would be a one in in like an add immediate instruction so let's let's actually look at an add immediate instruction i think we have one So here's an add immediate instruction where, let me grab the whole thing.
OK. So let's pretend this is our atom media instruction where this is. This is T0, this is T2, and our immediate is whatever this is. So. It'd be easier if I just clear this out. OK, so. In this instruction, bits. 20 through 16 are always going to come here. That's our whatever. So. This is 31 through 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. And then these ones are 15 to zero just so that we can label them all. So what's happening in this add immediate instruction. Is bits 25 through 21. Which are these ones are RS. And let's grab the. The instruction here. So an add immediate instruction is. Hold on. Add immediate instruction. Looks like this. So RT, RS, and immediate. RT is what we're going to store into. RS is what we're going to add with. So our RS is what we're adding with. RT is what we're storing into. So RS, we're going to have to read the contents of RS. That's read address one. And that's going to be the day that we're adding. OK, what comes down here, 15 through zero. That's our immediate. So. This is our immediate. It's going to go through this mux. And the contents of this first read register are going to come out here. And this is regardless of any mux, uh, any muxes that happen. This mux is going to select for the immediate. The result is going to get added. Pass that back to memory or pa back to the register file. So here's where we're at. The result from this ALU operation for the add immediate has passed through everything, gotten through this mux, and is back on the right data. Now what we want to happen is we want the result to get written to register RT. Because if we look back at the add immediate instruction, RT, RS, immediate. So RT is, is what's getting stored into. And if we look at where RT fits in our bits, RT is bits 20 through 16. So Bits 20 through 16 need to be our right address. We need to write to those bits. So that's where we would be selecting this top path. Because bits 15 through 11, that's just part of our immediate. It has no meaning as an address in this situation. But because we're using only two registers, the second register, we're not going to read from it, but we're going to write to it instead. Okay. Yeah, very good questions. These, <laughs> this thing is kind of a mess. Uh, but you know, if you step through it, you work it out step by step. It, it does make sense after a while, maybe after you spend like a year and a half looking at it. <laughs> but um, any other questions about this computer architecture stuff? Yeah. I don't think so, because it really depends on what the ALU looks like, and I don't think I would say double check for this, uh, for like the ALU op, make sure you know what your professor is expecting. Because in reality, that'll be some string of bits. Yeah, because in our labs, we get like an XC and then we get that actually the same. So it, in the last lab, they said um, when you're doing an R type, so the first part is all zeros, right? For the R type. Yeah. The ALU op, they said just to write in FC for function code, which are the last six bits, right? Okay. So that. We just use that at the bottom instead of at the top. OK, yeah, and that makes sense. If there's certain ways that it could be broken up where like the function is all that you need to control the ALU, because I think a lot of those. Uh, if we go to. Add so add has all zeros. Um, 
and like a bitwise and has all zeros nor or uh what else sub they all have an op code of all zeros so it comes down to the function code to tell the alu whip thing to do so that's probably what it means like if it's an art if it's one of these r type instructions then the then this guy yeah right now it's getting the last five bits so it's just taking the function code in in the case of yeah in the case where there's no immediate right if this was the plan extended immediate then this has no meaning as a as a function code but in those cases then yeah i think you can just write you can probably just write the function code but yeah you don't need to know what's going on inside of this because it really depends any other questions is there anything else from previous exams that you'd want to look over the videos are posted so we have uh recordings for the previous two exams and there's also if you go to the ieee youtube page you can find old videos for this class under like the ds digital circuits digital <laughs> yeah circuits <doesn't> throw <laughs> yeah, digital systems playlists um those are from a couple of years ago and from what I understand, this stuff, believe it or not, they actually used to hit it a lot harder. You we used to spend a lot more time on this. So, um, and that helped me a lot because I took this class a couple of years ago when we spent a whole lot of time. We had to do a whole lot of stuff with this. Um, and then that helped me when I took computer architecture because computer architecture was comparatively easy. But it was crazy because you're like a sophomore and you're trying to like, there was like all this other stuff up there. But I think if you understand this level, you should be good as long as, if you understand, how we get to all this stuff like like that you look at where the bits are you can decode the instruction you can follow them you know how to select which mux goes where then you're, you're ready for anything with these because it doesn't lie to you it's all right there but the old videos are there uh especially for the old exam stuff like kmaps and stuff they probably have more examples if you used up all the examples that we have but um any other questions about anything i think we went through pretty much everything that i had prepared for for this content um and then the old exam reviews that i did as well as the old exam reviews from previous semesters are up your exam is like this weekend or something or yeah saturday. yeah i think i have like saturday at like nine or something okay Yes, I do not miss a Saturday exams. I like I think my calculus exams are always on like Friday or Saturday. Friday. Yeah. And like all my friends are like, hey, you want to go hang out? Oh, no, I have an exam at like 7 p.m. Like, like the fifty-two finals like on a Monday and like goes from like eight to eleven. Like, see. I mean like they're right that I have nothing better going on, but they don't need to know that. Like, what if what if I had plans? Well, yeah, this is about all we have. Uh, you can always reach out on the Discord if you have specific questions between now and your exam. Like, if you're looking at any old materials and you uh, you need help with anything. Um, anyone online, any questions? I think we'll probably wrap it up here. Uh, but thanks for coming, and uh, good luck on your exams.